we're going to talk about Ahab. Ahab could have been an incredible king. There it is, I said it. Ahab could have been the king that would have brought the nation out of spiritual desolation. Even though Ahab had an evil father, so did Hezekiah. And look at how Hezekiah turned out. When we think of Ahab, there's some really good lessons we can learn from him. And, and the first is 1 Kings 20, 26 and 27. And what I want to talk to you about first is that Ahab was quite the leader. I know he's often portrayed as a vacillating, weak king, but that's not true. Here's an incident in 1 Kings 20, 26 and 27, when he's going out to battle. And the children of Israel were numbered and all were present. And they went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. Now you think about it. Ahab's tiny little army should have been swallowed up by this huge Syrian army. And if you just want a reference, 2 Samuel 13, 5 and 6. Here's the exact same situation with Saul. This time it's the Philistines, not the Syrians. And it says, and the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came and pitched in Michmash, eastward of Beth Avon. And when the men of Israel saw they were in a strait, right? This is exactly the same as Ahab and the Syrians. Look at what the people do under Saul. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Ahab's army did not panic. He must have been an incredible leader. And you think of men who were in Ahab's army, like Jehu and Bidkar, mighty men of their own right, were inspired by their king, Ahab. All Israel was present, and they were just two little flocks against a multitude that filled the country before them. And his troops were loyal to him. Saul's troops ran away and hid. You know, in our writings, he always is portrayed as weak and vacillating. But what it seems to me the problem is, was who he chose for a spouse. I think the root in Ahab's issues was Jezebel, his wife. Now let's meet the family real quick. His dad was Amri, and Amri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord he did worse than all that were before him. So he even outdid Jehoshaphat. And then Ahab, the description's almost the same. Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all, above all that were before him. Almost like a competition. He was even worse than his dad, who was worse than the ones before him. And then Jezebel, his wife, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbael, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshiped him. It would be Jezebel that introduced Baal worship to Israel. And, and from the way I reckon it, it seems like Ahab and Jezebel were married before he was a king. Uh, possibly another alliance that was formed between Amri and the Sidonians. And even worse off, she was his spiritual advisor. He turned to her for the answers. And she provoked him. She pushed his buttons. And here's the verse, 1 Kings 21, 25. There was none like unto Ahab, which did 
sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And that has the idea of a prick to entice, to provoke. She got under his, his skin and made him do what she wanted. And that seems to me to be the problem of Ahab. That's where he went wrong. In Hebrews 10, verse 24, we read this. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Do you know that verse and that word provoke is always used negatively? It's always used to provoke somebody to do wrong, like Jezebel provoked Ahab to sin. It's always used negatively. And here's Paul seizing on that negative word and making it positive. It's almost like he's saying, and just imagine me and my two brothers, Dave and Rich. When we were small, we knew how to push each other's buttons. We know what would get under the skin of each other well into our teen years. And we could do it. And, and we took joy, I think, and glee and, and teasing each other. That's what the word provoke means. But if I know how to get under somebody's skin to do wrong, how much better if I knew that person to get them to do right? To, to take that knowledge I have of somebody and pressing it so that they would do something good, encourage them for something right. And that's what Paul does in this chapter in Hebrews. Take what was considered an evil idea, an evil process, and turn it around for good and use it that way instead. But poor Ahab, his wife knew just what to do, what buttons to press to get him to do what she wanted. So simple lesson is, are we provoking each other to do good things? It's easy to push someone's buttons for bad, but can we harness that for good? Paul says we can, and so we should. Now let's get back to Ahab. I, I really did say he could have been one of the greatest kings in Israel. And, and think of some of the things that the Lord tried to do for Ahab. He tried to save Ahab, I think, more than any other king in Israel. The greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, was sent to save Ahab. For three and a half years, God withheld the dew and the rain to let Ahab realize that there is a God in heaven. On Mount Carmel, fire fell from heaven, consumed a sacrifice that had been drenched in barrels and barrels of water. And even Ahab said, the Lord, he is God. God defeated the Syrians twice for Ahab. When Ahab sins after Naboth, he repents. And it wasn't a fake repentance. They weren't crocodile tears. God himself recognized his humility and acknowledged his repentance. And finally, we talked about this with Jehoshaphat. Up until the very last battle, the very last arrow shot, God tried to save Ahab. He told him through Micaiah, you're going to die. The sheep will be led astray. And he's reminding them, you know, you're a shepherd. Listen to the Lord. God tried to save Ahab. And Ahab could have done incredible things if he had only changed. In 1 Samuel 2, 24, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 12, 24, only fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. 
I mean, that could have been said of Saul. But consider what God had done for Ahab. You know, just a quick digression. You know, as I get older, and I can look back at my life. I can see all the times the Lord has answered my prayers, where he's intervened on my, my, to help me, where he saved me from close calls. You know, there's that expression there, but the grace of God go I. And I can see them in my life where God has protected me. If only Ahab could have considered what the Lord had done for him. Just like I remember what the Lord has done for me. He's active in our lives. If we just open our eyes and watch. These words were especially true for Ahab. Consider how great things he hath done for you. So let's talk about Naboth's vineyard. Now let me give you the Sunday school summarization. This is how you could write the book quickly. It's a really simple story as, as we heard it read. Naboth owned a vineyard next to a palace. The palace belonged to Ahab. Ahab wanted to buy the vineyard and make a garden out of it. Ahab offers to buy the vineyard above market price. Naboth refuses. Jezebel sees the problem, kills Naboth. Ahab gets the vineyard. I mean, that's it. That's the story. But it's amazing how much is in that story we would miss. Naboth, if we haven't realized it, is a type of Christ. Think of all the types. Upheld God's command. The rulers tried to make him break the law. His death was sought because he was the heir of the vineyard. He remained faithful and unmoved. Jew and Gentile combined to destroy him. False witnesses were enrolled. His trial was a, a mockery. The outcome was already assured. He was accused of blasphemy. He was not guilty, but it didn't matter. And then he was taken out of the city for a cruel death and his children were persecuted. All of that is true for Naboth and it's all true for Christ. But there's even more to it than that. When Ahab tried to buy the vineyard from Naboth, Naboth said, in 1 Kings 21, 1 to 3, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. That little phrase speaks volumes about Naboth. He knew who he was talking to. He knew what Ahab and Jezebel were capable of. The Lord forbid it me. He's standing straight before the Lord. You know, the land, and sometimes we don't quite realize this, is it's a symbol of God's promises. They, they were placed on the land for a purpose. It was divvied up by Joshua at the Lord's command. For instance, Numbers 26, 52. Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To everyone shall his inheritance be given to those that were numbered of him. And if you keep going down through Leviticus, the land was a promise to the people. It was to stay in their families, and if it had to be sold, it was given back on the year of Jubilee. And when the land was divvied up, by Joshua so many years ago, Naboth's fate almost was set because his property fell hard by the palace of Ahab. And the result was he found himself in a hard or a difficult place. Now, what you don't realize about Naboth and Ahab is that little story speaks volumes about Ahab. 
And I don't think we quite realize it. And I want to explain what I mean. Ahab is the king. Why didn't he just take it? Why didn't he send men like Jehu over to pull up the vines and toss the family out? And if they objected to show them the edge of the sword and they would back away. Uh, today we call that eminent domain when a government seizes property. And you know what? Ahab had legal permission in a sense to do that. Do you remember when the people asked for a king and Samuel told them what the kings would do to them? That he, the king, will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them. So Samuel already warned the people that men like Ahab could seize whatever they wanted. But Ahab doesn't. Why not? Wouldn't that be the easiest solution? You see, Ahab knew God's law. And he respected it enough not to seize this man's inheritance. Think about that. There were lots of ways to get a vineyard, but he didn't because he understood the law and he respected it. You see, there was good in Ahab. Ahab knew the law. So why did he fail? 1 Kings 21, verse 7. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Unlike Ahab, she had no respect for God's law. She wouldn't bend the knee to the Lord, even in her mind. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth. You know, only God could do that. Those verses in front of you show that. The land was given to the people for an eternal possession. She subverts God's law and she twists it to suit herself. That's what the apostasy does. They take the truth and they twist it just enough so it still has a semblance of the original, but it serves their own means. And so Jesus uses Jezebel as a caricature of apostasy and revelation. Now, let me ask you another question. Why didn't Jezebel assassinate Naboth and seize the vineyard? Right. Send some people over in the middle of the night, kill him and his family, leave them for dead. No one would be the wiser. And then the vineyard would be would be Ahab's. She doesn't do that either. And that would seem to be the easy solution. But you see, that's not how apostasy works. It had to appear, it had to appear proper for outsiders. Ahab's reputation had to be preserved. Apostasy always gives the impression of righteousness, the appearance of righteousness, but it just appropriates God's words to suit their own means. And again, you read Revelation 2.20. That's how Jesus uses Jezebel in Revelation. Now you think of Jeroboam. We talked about in the first class. It says, Jeroboam forsook the law. And that literally means Jeroboam loosened the law. And it brought disaster. Brothers and sisters, that's why knowing your Bible is important. Turning to it for answers when problems arise, when we're questioned, the answers are there. We need to look for them. I think maybe the most ironic thing is that Jezebel uses God's law to kill Naboth. How evil is that? Everything done in the death of Naboth was done by the book. 
two false witnesses, blasphemed God, and just to be safe, blasphemed the king. And she also ensured that all the sons were killed, so there were no legal heirs left for the vineyard. And, and you see the law that Jezebel knew. Think about this. Jezebel knew, Exodus twenty two twenty eight, Thou shalt not revile God, nor curse a ruler of thy people. She knew that. That was the charge against Naboth. Jezebel knew Leviticus 24, 16. He that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall stone him, as well the stranger, as he that is born in the land when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. She knew the law, and she used it against poor Naboth. See, there was no loose ends. Everything was above board, so it would seem. And the vineyard was given to Ahab. In this passage in Revelations 2.20, it says, speaking from the Lord Jesus' perspective, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach, to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. In this picture of Jezebel and the apostasy she's building, we have a picture of Jesus. And in Revelation, Jesus is walking among the candlesticks, the ecclesias. And as Jesus is walking through the ecclesias, like he does yours and mine on a Sunday morning, he's looking at their hearts and their motives. I know thy works. And that's used to these ecclesias. He's looking at our hearts. I know thy works. And then in Naboth's vineyard, we have a picture of Elijah walking through the vineyard, almost like the Ecclesia, God's inheritance. And he confronts Ahab. And what does he say? In essence, I know thy works. I know what you've done, Ahab. Now I want to read 1 Kings 21, 19. 1 Kings 21, 19. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, This is the Lord talking to Elijah. Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Thou hast killed. Now, Wait a minute. Ahab didn't kill Naboth. He didn't even know the killing was occurring. He was sulking back in the palace. But yet Elijah says to him through the Lord, thou hast killed. Well, how do we understand that? Today in politics, in government, there's this idea of plausible deniability. Whereas you don't document anything in an email or, or, or you don't film it or tape it or anything, but you don't let people know that you knew what was happening. I had a governor who, through his minions, closed the George Washington Bridge in New York. And he claimed, I didn't know anything about it. And for three days, it just destroyed northern New Jersey through gridlock by blocking most of the lanes on that bridge. And he claimed, I don't know anything about it. But his two aides were the ones that did it to punish the mayor of Fort Lee, New Jersey. The point is, God knows our hearts and motives. Even though Ahab didn't do it, he knew about it, 
He knew what Jezebel was capable of, and he couldn't hide behind plausible deniability. And the only reason I stress that is sometimes we think that where we might know something's happening, but we're not really involved in it, and we just let it happen. Well, if that ever happens in our lives or ecclesias or families, God still knows our motives, and he still holds us responsible. Ahab knew what Jezebel could do, and he was responsible for her. So let's read this confrontation. It's keep staying in Kings, 1 Kings 21, and we're going to start at verse 20. I know it was read, but let's get it fresh in our minds. And Ahab said to Elijah, hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee. I will take away thy posterity. I will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Beasha, son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat. Him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there shall none like, but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And finally, verse 27, And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, he rent his clothes. He put sackcloth upon his flesh. He fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went softly. Now, did you notice anything in that passage? In verse 25 and 26, what you have here is a comment by the writer of Kings. Whoever inscribed the Kings put his comment in verse 25 and 26. He puts the epitaph of Ahab right in the middle of this passage of words that Elijah is speaking. He stops it, talks about how Ahab and his evil, and then Elijah continues his speech. In the middle of it, the writer of the Kings picks up what Elijah has said. And the important thing, I think, in all of that are the words, you have sold yourself. That's the divine epitaph. That's what God made sure was inserted into this speech. Ahab, you have sold yourself. I got a question for you. What does it mean to sell yourself? How do you sell yourself? We often, especially, and I've heard this spoken of of Ahab, we suggest that he traded the truth, that he sold out the truth for evil, right? That's kind of how it reads, doesn't it? He sold out and now he's an evil person. That's not correct. That's really not what this is telling us. You see, when this phrase, he sold himself, is used in scripture, it means making yourself a slave. A prisoner. You can see it, Leviticus 25, 44, if you want. It also means or being sold by someone else to be a slave. Like Joseph's brothers sold him. They sold Joseph 
to be a slave. Selling yourself has no idea of trading truth for something evil. It means selling yourself to become a slave. It also means selling your inheritance or your birthright, like Esau did to Jacob. Or selling your land, your inheritance. This idea of trading good for evil is not behind that word. And that's an important clue into what we're going to talk about next. You think about it, future kings of Israel and the world. King Ahab sold himself to be a slave, a bond servant. What that's telling us is the king traded his position of kingship voluntarily, willingly to be a slave. He's a free man. And somehow in his twisted mind, he thinks he would be better off as a slave. He sold himself. Here's a man with hope, a future, an inheritance. And now he's a man with nothing. Hopeless. Helpless. Facing certain death. That's what it means when Ahab sold himself. Well, why would anybody do that? That doesn't make sense. Why would Ahab, a king, sell himself? Only, only when we walk away from God do we understand what that means. When we leave the Father, that's the fate we're trading ourselves for. When you walk away from the Lord, you become a slave, hopeless, helpless, destitute, a free person who now is a prisoner. And when we read that passage in Kings, when the writer inserted that comment about Ahab, it wasn't Elijah that said it, it was a comment that the Lord made sure was in the record that's exactly how the Lord looked at Ahab. He had everything, the potential to be in God's kingdom forever, and he sold it to be a slave with no hope, no future. And you know, when we looked at all those they've sold things, that's exactly what Esau did. Esau sold no value in the birthright, in his inheritance. What profit shall this birthright do to me? And he sold it. He sold the most valuable possession for a piece of dirt. Esau sold it for a bowl of soup. How foolish Ahab and Esau were. And then you contrast that with Naboth. Naboth couldn't. Naboth wouldn't do that. Naboth clung to God's inheritance and refused. The Lord forbid it me. And he knew the consequences of saying that to the king of Israel. You see, and, and this is the tricky part. Ahab didn't sell God because God wasn't his to sell. Ahab didn't sell the truth because the truth can't be bought and sold. We know that, Acts 8, verse 20. And Peter said to Simon, thy money perish with thee, because thou thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money? Judas didn't sell Jesus. He sold himself. Do you understand how understanding this little phrase changes our perspective on a lot of other scriptures. And you think about it. Ahab sold himself to live in the deepest, darkest dungeon, the innermost prison with no light and no hope. Look at Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. 
We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Ahab chose not to be one of the Lord's sheep. And it's so ironic that that last battle we talked about with the two small flocks, he's reminded both by the prophet Micaiah and by the very situation that he was a shepherd protecting sheep. And he sold it. He was the shepherd. The people were the sheep. And when he fights and destroys the Syrians, he wins. He preserves them. But he's also reminded of that lesson on the day he dies. Because on that day, Micaiah says, I saw all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master, no ruler. You know, being God's shepherd or, or his pastor, as the word means, is our high calling. It was Ahab's high calling. And he sold that for nothing. In 1 Corinthians 7, 23, it's on the bottom of the screen. It is the Lord who has made payment for you. Be not servants of men. And I'd also like to read Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. See, we have nothing to do with the payment. You can't buy and sell God or the truth. But we're buying and selling our future. Here's 1 Corinthians 7, 23 in the Bible in basic English. It is the Lord who has made payment for you. Be not servants of men. Ahab chose to be a servant. He sold himself for nothing. Now, this is a funny passage. And I wonder if you ever really thought about it. Now, you may have arrived at the conclusion that's, that I think is correct on your own. And if you have, bear with me. But when I read Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, I was really puzzled by it. And I'm going to read it for you. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And that last part is what confused me, brothers and sisters. And I'll just share with you. I was thinking really hard about this. And I'm just staring off into space. And my wife actually came into the room and said, are you all right? It didn't make sense to me. I looked it up and nobody explained what this verse really meant. And like we should do, we should pray when we're stumped. Pray that scriptures are open to us. And the answer to Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, falls so perfectly into our description and study of Ahab. Here's my suggestion in relation to Ahab. I think what Paul is saying here is that those who have been saved, like us, those who have been bought, as we just read before, who payment has been made for, if believers reject Jesus who died for us, if we reject Jesus who suffered for us, if we rejected Jesus who ascended from the grave to Prove to us he was God's son. If we reject him being delivered to heaven, if we reject the idea of him returning to us, if we reject Christ like that, denying everything about him, it's as if we're saying, put him back on the cross. I don't want any part of him. Let him hang there. Brothers and sisters who are saying, I have no use for Jesus. Put them back up. 
what a horrible thing to say or to think. It's literally jaw dropping. That's what happens when we leave the truth. Put them back up. Crucify them. Ahab chose darkness. He literally chose death over Jesus. And then you got to think of it this way. How shameful is that for Jesus, for somebody to reject him that way? for someone to choose life over all he did for us. Consider what great things the Lord did for Ahab. And he said, I'd rather be dead. Do you understand the level of pain and anguish that falls on Jesus when one leaves the truth? Jesus gave us literally the best he could offer And all we say in return is, put him back up. I have no use for him. That's what Paul's describing in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. six. In Isaiah 52, verse 3. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, but you shall be redeemed without money. In other words, you sold yourself for money. You sold no value in yourself, right? There's nothing good about me. There's no value. There's no worth. But then he says, God has redeemed us with the priceless blood of his son. Without Christ, we're nothing. With the Lord, we have everything. Paul says those who do this are haters of God in Hebrews 10, 26 through 29. Now let me give you another example to illustrate this. Just to show you how horrible this phrase is and how horrible it is when Ahab sold himself. Think of Peter. He is in the innermost darkest part of a cold and damp prison with no light, in chains, waiting death in the morning, right? He's in the position that Saul or that Ahab chose to be. Peter's in the prison. He's locked up with no hope. That's what Ahab bought. That's what he sold himself for. And now imagine Peter leaving the prison and once out when he comes to himself instead of going to Mary's house he turns around and walks back into the prison that's what Ahab did he could have been saved he could have been one of God's servants and he chose death in Isaiah 61 verse 1 And part of verse 2. Oops, I'm sorry. I had that before you. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. You know, this is the last verse you would ever think to apply to Ahab. But it's filled with with echoes of Ahab. It's echoes of redemption and jubilee, echoes of healing, echoes of Christ's return. And the jubilee only occurs on the appointed date or when the high priest dies. All of this applies to Ahab and redeeming the land or or not. In Isaiah 61, our high priest died to set us free. In Isaiah 61, the appointed day, 
uh, there would be an appointed day that Jesus would return, that the servants would be released from the grave, released from sin. And, and bear with me. That's what God offered Ahab. Freedom, not being a prisoner, a captive to sin. Freed out of the darkness that he was chained to. And I want to draw your attention to that verse, opening of the prison in Isaiah 61. It literally means opening of the eyes wide. And you can imagine somebody coming out of a dark prison into the bright daylight. And that's what it means, opening the eyes wide. Seeing there's a whole world here that I missed. Look at what I have. I had none of that in prison. In Isaiah 42, verse 7, we read this. To open the blind eyes. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. And then that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. God would do all that for Ahab. And he chose to walk back in to the prison. What a tragedy that is. We know once Ahab truly did repent, but he kept returning to the prison house, to servitude, to sin. And finally, in the end, he turns from God with all finality. He didn't think much of God's word, what Mikey Aya said, and he dies a prisoner. Judas repented after he betrayed Jesus. He was brokenhearted. The high priest could do nothing to help Judas. In fact, the high priest literally says to Judas when he returns the money, that's your business. But the problem with Judas and the problem with Ahab is they didn't turn to God either. The God who paid a price above anything to save them whose business it is to save us, was never consulted, respected, or obeyed. So Judas, too, dies a prisoner. In Isaiah 61, verse 2, Isaiah speaks of the day of vengeance. Look at the thread that ties these kings and queen together with. There's a phrase that occurs to all of them. Jeroboam, shall the dogs eat? Baasha, shall the dogs eat? Ahab, dogs shall eat. And Jezebel, the dogs shall eat. These words were spoken to Ahab and Jezebel. In fact, reading the title, it says, and I will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the house of Beasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. Now there's something about these phrases, shall the dogs eat. In Luke 24, verse 39, Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Jesus was pierced in the hands and feet. In Psalm 22, verse 16, and I have this on a slide. So Jesus, the signs of his punishment, the signs of his death from a cruel world were the dogs, right? The dogs did this to him. Psalm twenty-two, sixteen. 16. Dogs have come around me. 
I am shut in by a band of evildoers. They made wounds in my hands and feet. Verse 16, from another version. For dogs have surrounded me. A company of evildoers have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and feet. The Masoretic text reads, like a lion, they pin my hands and feet. When that passage in Hebrews was read, they crucify him anew. It was his enemies. It was those who did evil in God's sight. And it's interesting that those four generations are described as dogs. And you actually have a picture of a lion pinning a man's hands and feet down and killing him. Well, that's what the dogs did to Jesus, his enemies. They pierced his hands and feet. That means to bite, to attack the son of God, like the bite of a lion. And finally, Ahab and Jezebel, die outside the city. They, they did crucify Jesus in a sense with their wickedness. And they die outside the city. And that's one more important thing. They died outside. And, and here we go again. And let me see if I can tie this up. Jesus says, I am the first and the last, the start and the end, the blessing for those whose robes are washed so that they may have a right to the tree of life, may go in by the doors into the town, right? So the believers are inside the city. Who's left outside? Outside are the dogs, those who make use of evil powers, who make themselves unclean, the takers of life, those who give worship to images, and everyone who's delight is in what is false. Those are the actions of Amri, Basha, Ahab, Jezebel. In their opinion, Jesus was of no use. They attacked him, as it were, piercing his hands and his feet. But in the end, they die outside the city with no hope. They tried to inflict pain on the righteous, but in the end, they returned to the dust. I wanna just change gears for one second to kind of tie up a couple thoughts from today. When you think about Ahab, he always seems to have an identity crisis. At one moment, he seems strong, and then the next, his wife pushes him in the wrong direction. In a sense, he doesn't stand up for himself. In our class on Saul, we finished with a segment about controlling sin, and Brother Tim alluded to that in his prayer. And I know we rushed through it a little bit in the first class, but taking ownership, taking control of your body and saying, I don't do this. Whatever it is, whatever sin you're fighting against, I don't do this versus I shouldn't. Well, we don't quite have the whole picture there. That is effective and it works and it has worked for me. Because when you say I don't, you're saying that's not who I am. I don't do things like that. When we come into Christ, we join him, right? We're transformed into his identity. And that's what we're putting on, on ourselves. Put on Christ, be clothed with Christ. It means we think and we act more like Christ and less like me. Now I wanna give you an example of this and it's a little subtle, but I think it's effective. Imagine there were two people and you offered the first person a cigarette and they would reply, no thanks, I'm trying to quit. Do you see the problem with that? The person still thinks of himself 
as a cigarette smoker. No thanks, I'm trying to quit. His identity is still a cigarette smoker who's trying to change. That's a problem. Well, what happens if you offer a cigarette in this instance to the other person? He says, no thanks, I'm not a smoker. They both said no, but the second refused because that's not who he is. That's not part of his identity. He doesn't see himself as a smoker. And so when you say I don't, that's not part of your identity, which you're refusing. Look at the world through Christ's eyes. Remember, you're part of his identity. And when you think of yourself as joined to him and his identity becomes you, it will help you in your struggle against sin. You shouldn't see yourselves in a sense as sinners. Your identity is not a sinner. Your identity is Christ. You've been clothed with Christ. You've been baptized into Christ. You were trying to be one with Christ. So instead of seeing your identity, the way you think of yourself as just a sinner who's trying to do good, I want to leave you with a phrase. I want you to think of yourself this way. I am a saint in God's kingdom. I am a saint in God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, that is your true identity. And it may sound pretentious or not. It doesn't matter. That's the identity that Jesus has given you through the Father. When we're in the world, when we're dealing with temptations and desires, reminding yourself who you are, what your true identity is, will help. Two weeks ago, I actually heard a person who made this suggestion. And I was at a conference, and I thought it was so good I actually bought the book. And, and this man, I'll show you his book at the end, this man stressed the idea of identity, that when you have an identity in your mind of who you are, it helps you make decisions. And that's true. Uncle Bob Lloyd would always take business books, and he had an eye for seeing that they were taking spiritual principles and turning them into business practices. And what Brother Bob would do is take these business practices that they perverted with Scripture and bring out the Scripture behind them. And that's exactly what I think I do with this book. It's called Atomic Habits. I'm not quite done it but it's very helpful in changing yourself, understanding your identity and how having your identity firmly in your mind will help you in the decision-making process. And I'll give you one example I read in the book, just to make it clear. He, he talks about a friend of his and, and she lost a hundred pounds. That, that's quite an accomplishment, isn't it? And you can imagine, I have trouble losing a pound. She lost a hundred pounds. And this is how she did it. And tell me if it sounds familiar. She did it by deciding that she was going to be a healthy person. And whenever she was tempted with food or drink, she would say a healthy person wouldn't eat that or drink that. When she was tempted about either walking to the store or driving, she would always say a healthy person would walk. A healthy person would use the stairs. That will work with sin too. A saint in Christ's kingdom doesn't do that. They don't look upon a woman with the wrong idea. They don't steal, they don't cheat, they don't tell lies. They don't watch things that are wrong on television or in movies. I am a saint in God's kingdoms. Brothers and sisters, there's a Psalm that causes me some trouble. And we're gonna close on this point. 
I think it's pure hyperbole by the sons of Korah. It's Psalm 84, verse 10. And I'm going to read it to you through the Bible in basic English. And you, you know it. I know you already know this verse. It is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to be living in the tents of sin. And where I have a problem with that is, is it sets the standard really low. Do we really want to think of ourselves as squeezing in the kingdom by the skin of our teeth, just making it, getting a D plus, so that we can enter into the city, into the kingdom? See, the problem is it implies that we would be content with humble, by being a humble doorkeeper. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But brothers and sisters, God does not want hundreds and thousands of eternal doorkeepers in the prison or in the kingdom. The father doesn't want this army of doorkeepers. He's looking for people to teach and preach all the things we've talked about. In fact, the kingdom doesn't need a single doorkeeper. When Peter and the angel left the prison, the door opened automatically. So instead of imagining yourself as just squeezing into the kingdom, walk in spotless, which your, your Lord has done for you. Think of this verse in Philippians 3, verse 13. And we're going to close on this. Philippians 3, starting at 13. This should be our attitude. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forget those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the high mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if any there be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Brothers and sisters, press toward the high calling God has for you as future leaders, rulers, and his kingdom that's sure to come hopefully soon. Thank you for your time tonight and have a good evening.